Okay, I think that's probably enough time. Um, it's now my pleasure to hand over to Rich to run through today's data. Thanks, Ashley. Um, obviously, as always, we've got a lot to get through. So do bear with us because, yeah, there's a lot to cram in a relatively short space of time. Um, also, you've done introductions already, which is great. Um, I guess by way of a quick introduction for anyone not familiar with what, who we are uh, on, on the call today, so we have, do have three distinct arms of the business. We have our listings platform, uh, students.com, which is the largest dedicated student listings platform in the UK, advertising over 750,000 beds nationwide. We're also a leading provider of property management software to the industry, uh, both to HMOs as well as PBSA. And actually, the end of last year, we rebranded that offering, so it's now called Concurrent. Um, and to date, we've executed over 2.2 billion in tenancy value for our customers. And then we obviously have our research and data offering, which can leverage those two platforms along with third-party data sets to provide really granular, independent data and advice to a really broad range of stakeholders. Um, in terms of the topics we'll be covering today, so we're going to have a quick recap of the latest UCAS data. Um, we'll then dive into updates to search behavior from students, quick overview of planning and the in interesting trends there um, before looking at early PBSA occupancy data sets. And then, as we've said, we'll go to Q&As and, and uh, Fusion and Tom's presentations as well. So to start with, let's look back at the headline national stats uh, from UCAS. So these go up to the 2023-24 letting cycle. Just to start with the UK numbers, I won't spend loads of time on this because I think most people will be familiar with the kind of broad demographic trends. Um, but we can see from the chart on the right, this is the number of acceptances per year, specifically from UK students. And as we can see, they've clearly been trending upwards. Obviously, the main consideration there is that trend has been occurring despite the decline in 18 year olds in the UK. And that's predominantly been driven by rising participation rates. Interestingly, that trend, as we, again, most of us will probably know this, is going to reverse. So we're going to see a lot more 18 year olds in the UK up to 2030, and it does decline back down after that. Having looked at the latest 2023 numbers, so we did see a small decline uh, this year, so about 1.3%. But as we can see from the line graph on the right-hand side, they're still very much up on the long-term trend and actually up 4% compared to uh, kind of pre-COVID levels in 2019. Um, moving on to international demand, uh, so this chart on the right is just looking at either non-EU acceptances, obviously not including the UK anymore, as well as EU numbers, and very similar trends really, particularly from an international perspective. So we did see a slight decline in 2023, um, so a dip there about 2.4%, but again, long term, the trend still very much positive. Even if we compare that to 2019, so again, kind of pre-COVID levels, we're looking at a 35% increase uh, in terms of those yearly acceptances from non-EU students. Um, obviously, Brexit has caused a pretty dramatic collapse in EU numbers, which we can see from the charts. That's continued, so another fall for 2023, 2.5%. Uh, um, and actually looking at the long-term figure there, we can see that Compared to 2020, numbers down almost 68%, or roughly 67%, so pretty significant. The point that's worth mentioning, though, is that as a percentage of the total, EU numbers are now a very small proportion, so less than 2% of all acceptances in 2023 were from the EU. So whilst a dramatic decline, hasn't had a huge impact to, uh, to demand. Uh, moving on to specifically look at China, obviously, and India in this case, um, obviously particularly important for the PBSA market. Again, we can see a slight year-on-year -year fall. So Chinese acceptances down by almost uh, 6%, but again, long-term trend still very much uh, positive. And if we look over the you know, very long period, so back to, say, 2014, almost 150% increase in new acceptances from China. So yes, a short-term blip but the long trend, term trend is still very much positive. In terms of possible reasons for that most recent decline, um, arguably probably somewhat of a rebasing of demand, particularly during COVID. Um, obviously, certain countries saw their borders remaining closed. Obviously, the UK was relatively open, um, so possibly the UK attracting a greater share of total Chinese demand during COVID. And obviously, a lot of those countries are obviously now open, so more competition in that front. Um, in terms of Indian numbers, They've actually carried on growing, so 3% increase this year. 
Um, what we're going to keep a very close eye on is obviously changes to any visa uh, rules, particularly around dependence. So one to keep an eye on really to see if that does have a negative impact, specifically for Indian students, given they sometimes do bring uh, dependence with them. Looking at specific universities next. Um, so I, I guess one point to highlight, because we have seen this, particularly in the last few weeks, around negative stories, particularly around international numbers. And this chart really highlights that, yes, national trends are interesting, but actually every university is different. In this particular case, we picked out a number of universities that saw very good growth in, again, non-EU international acceptances, depending on how you want to describe it for 2023, and you can see see those numbers there. Um, so yeah, very strong, despite those kind of national kind of headlines that we've seen in some of the press. Specifically, those stories, interestingly as well, were, were primarily referencing India and Nigerian demand, and arguably, particularly Nigerian demand is not necessarily gonna be the primary target market for PVSA, so just interesting to note that. An area that is less clear though is around postgrad numbers. Um, there have been reported issues regarding the data releases from HESA, which typically would be out by now. Um, the latest we've heard is that's not going to be until April, um, but that data set will give us a clear understanding in total numbers, so both undergraduate and postgraduates. And that is a problem. Um, the HESA data is always delayed. This year is particularly uh, delayed. So having accurate and timely data um, is a challenge and obviously does kind of mean there's more importance, I guess, with working with the university directly to understand their growth plans, but also in terms of looking at other data sets uh, as well. Just to pick out a couple of those universities in this slide, so University of Bristol, for example, saw numbers jump by almost 32%, so very significant. De Montfort, which is the top of that chart on the right, 67%, so huge year-on-year -year increases, again, despite some of the national press reporting a decline in, in Sasha numbers. This slide, we just wanted to really highlight some of the fluctuations we've seen um, from some universities. So in this particular example, all of these universities saw year on year declines. But the important point here is still the long term trend is very much up, um, which, again, just an interesting one to note, really. Having said that, it's not all rosy. So some universities have seen sustained declines over the long term, which we can see here. So this is showing the change in yearly acceptances over time versus 2014 levels. And just to pick out the University of Hertfordshire, which we can see um, has been pretty dramatically declining, we can see numbers are now almost 48% lower than they were in 2014, or about 2,500 students. So pretty rapid uh, drop off there. What is interesting to note, though, is this particular chart is looking at total acceptances. So what happens sometimes, you do find total demand declining but certain demographics increasing. So for example, Leeds Beckett University, whilst number, total numbers are down 23%, non-EU numbers are actually up 28%. So possibility to potentially look at some interesting opportunities um, there, and that's not always immediately obvious from some of the headline stats. Uh, moving on to the latest search behavior. So this is a chart we regularly include in these sessions, um, but it gives you the latest updates uh, in terms of what students are searching for. The chart on the right is utilizing, of all the searches being performed on the platform, um, what are students specifically looking for in terms of unit mix or size, i.e. are they searching for a studio, two bed, three bed, four bed, et cetera. What we can quite clearly see from the charts is if we look at Q1 2024, and that actually refers to October to December last year, because that's the start of the 2024 letting cycle. We can see as that letting cycle started, the demand shifted rapidly from smaller sizes in the end of 2023 season to larger sizes. We'd entirely expect that, so that is entirely expected, and that's predominantly driven by particularly UK students searching very early and typically wanting to live with two, three, four mates, and therefore searching for those larger sizes. Whereas if we go back to the end of the 2023 20, season, more international searching later, typically looking for smaller sizes, so studios and two beds. Obviously, from a marketing standpoint, interesting to note, particularly if you're trying to attract uh, either a particular demographic or you have either studios or clusters uh, in your kind of profile. 
Um, looking at some at some other search behavior next, and firstly, specifically HMOs. So the chart on the right is showing over quite a prolonged period at what price points are students viewing HMO properties over time. And we can clearly see over the long term that's been rising. So the price points being viewed by students, HMOs has been going up. What stands out straight away from that chart is those spikes. Those spikes coincide with the start of each letting cycle. And that does suggest that students moving early, so we're talking October, November, December for the following year to move in, are typically searching at higher price points. And predominantly that's going to be because they want the best quality HMOs, typically going to be a higher price points. If we look at the 2024 season so far, so again, October to December, end of last year, we can see of those properties, again, specifically HMOs being viewed, those price points are just over 9% higher than the same period last year. So pretty significant. Just for added context, um, something that's kind of flown under the radar from a kind of national press perspective, but relatively recently, it was announced that the maintenance loan increase for the 2024 uh, academic year is 2.5%. So straight away, you can see the problem there, where you have significant uplift in inflation, rental growth, and maintenance loan growth still nowhere near keeping up with that. And that's been the case for the last well, a number of years now. Um, last year, it was 2.8%. year before that, 2.3%. So those below inflation increases in maintenance loans having a real compounding effect on the affordability of uh, university, particularly for students in England. So again, just a very interesting point there. Uh, looking at PBSA next, again, as we'd expect, you can see the trend there has been very much positive. So clear, clearly upward trend there. Um, in terms of digging into that detail a bit more, um, we can see that actually opposite of the HMO market, we see some kind of seasonal dips at the start of each cycle. Obviously, at very early in the cycle, so we're talking probably October time, not all PBSA operators have their properties up and, and live for the upcoming season yet, and that will partly explain that. Equally, there is some natural seasonality involved, more domestic students searching earlier. We typically have lower budgets and as more international search as we go through the cycle, those are going to be searching at higher price points, which is why we see the upward trend. Arguably some impact of dynamic pricing as well, um, but actually relatively few, few operators are doing that uh, at scale. In terms of the increase so far this year, again, still early days, um, but of those PBSAs being viewed this year, uh, on average, just over 5% increase in terms of the price point uh, that they're being viewed at. Drilling into the PBSA listing of views data in a bit more detail, we've just split this out by UK students on the left or those from China on the right. And as you would expect, quite clearly, those searching from China have significantly higher budgets than those from the UK, which is really clear to see there. Arguably as well, interestingly, for the 2024 cycle, we can see the quarter on quarter, uh, sorry, the quarter on quarter growth, but based on year on year. So for example, for the UK, those viewing PBSA in the first quarter of 24, viewing properties at 6% increase compared to last year, whereas for those from China, 8.3%. So seems to suggest the ability for a Chinese student to stretch their budget uh, is obviously higher than what you'd expect uh, from a UK student. Uh, moving on to planning next, just a few updates there in terms of activity. Um, what we have actually seen, and we can see this uh, on the chart on the right-hand side, is an uptick in the number of beds being put forward. So a bit of a spike there in terms of those being submitted. Um, what will be very interesting to see is whether those actually follow through into approved beds, and there will be obviously a time delay there or a lag, and that's something we'll be keeping a close eye on. Um, but we can see activity is actually up year on year, um, but as the chart shows, still very much down compared to where we have been from a uh, historical standpoint. In terms of hotspots in the last quarter, so we can see that just over half of all the beds put forward in the last quarter were based in just three locations. So Glasgow and Manchester in particular, there's been a lot of reported issues around lack of supply, so not too surprising. Um, but again, the big question is how many of those beds are actually going to get delivered. Um, and obviously, those that do get delivered, you're looking at you know, two, three, four years out um, from actually coming online. Another interesting trend is 
looking at the makeup of that pipeline. So if we start with the pie chart on the left-hand side, this was the same period the year earlier. And we can see during that time, about half of all beds being put forward to planning were studios. Move forward 12 months, 67%. So a significant proportion of all the beds being put forward are consisting of studios. Obviously, on paper, they can uh, achieve higher rents in the current cost environment, current debt environment. That's going to be one of the contributing factors there. But as we've said multiple times in these sessions, both studio units are really going after a fraction of the total demand particularly the UK market who are not going to be looking at studios and really are looking for those three, four, five, possibly six bed clusters. Just a couple more quick ones to get through. Uh, I won't go through all these one by one. These are just a few of the notable uh, either uh, developments put forward or developments approved in the last quarter and some very big ones there, which we can see, um, particularly the 1200 bed scheme in Birmingham submitted uh, and the very significant scheme uh, also approved. In terms of supply growth, so for 2024, these numbers will continue to evolve. Um, but just to, again, reiterate the slowdown in the delivery of new beds, which we can see uh, via that chart there. Last year, we were looking at roughly 12,000 new beds added to the market, which is down significantly from a historical standpoint. We could see a slight uptick this year. Um, but again, we're not expecting to get anywhere near the average, which is more like 25,000 beds uh, since 2017. Um, by way of a quick update, uh, just a couple more slides to get through. Um, those on the call will be familiar with this, but some may not. Um, for everyone else, we have now uh, migrated our occupancy data to our data portal. So any existing participants in our occupancy survey are now able to access their data and compare that to the market on a city level. Um, so just a, a note on that. If you are interested in taking part in that survey and getting those insights, there is a QR code on screen now but equally do reach out to myself or the team afterwards and we can obviously have a chat about that. What that does mean is we can look at some interesting stats. So we've picked out Glasgow and, and Sheffield in these two cases. Starting with Glasgow on the left-hand side, we've specifically looked at studios and the lines represent the current season, so 2024, as well as the last two letting cycles. And we can really see that the market for studios in Glasgow has been slower than it was last year. Last year was particularly bullish, uh, and I know there were some cancellation issues at the end of the cycle, um, but interesting to note that. Um, obviously, we're up compared to 20, 22 levels, um, so still not a negative necessarily, but interesting to see the difference there. From a cluster perspective in Sheffield, straight away we can see how much slower that market is to let compared to studios in Glasgow, uh, which is very stark from that data. Equally, if we look at the data for 2024, we can see there's been no real material improvement, um, so no significant increase uh, or improvement in, in booking velocity. So two good examples of how the occupancy or leasing velocity can vary significantly per location. Um, just to summarise quickly before I hand over to, uh, to Brody, so as we've kind of touched on, appreciate we've gone through a lot very quickly, but do be aware of that nuanced demand. Um, national headlines and national stats aren't necessarily representative of individual universities or locations. The last few years have seen extraordinary growth in demand uh, during COVID. So again, some of the declines we may be experiencing are probably a bit of a rebasing of that demand pool. Affordability, I won't dwell on it. It gets you know, talked about a lot, um, but generally there is a, a real concern there, particularly for students uh, in the UK and those in England, where those maintenance loan increases are nowhere near keeping up with rental growth or inflation as well. And then finally, as we've just touched on, a lot of the developments in the pipeline are really focusing on the studio market. Um, and equally, we're seeing a real slowdown or lack of new beds coming to the market despite continued uh, good demand, basically. Um, that's it from me. What I'd love to do now is hand over to Brody. I'm really looking forward to, to his presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. Some really fascinating um, insights, I must say. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to take you on a quick whistle-stop tour of 2023, uh, looking at some of our highlights and some of the uh, obstacles that we, and I'm sure, many of us on this call and in the sector uh, have faced. Um, splitting this up into uh, 
into five key areas, um, the planning landscape, uh, well-being and the student experience, the construction market, our key themes of 2023 and our outlook for 2024. So looking back at 2023, as a group, we had a really successful year on the acquisition, planning, delivery and divestment front. Uh, we acquired just under 4,000 future beds across four super prime cities uh, in York, London, Cardiff and Southampton. We obtained planning on our sites in Loughborough and Birmingham, which was just under uh, 1,200 beds. Started on site in Liverpool, Nottingham and Manchester, which creates about 1,500 beds. Uh, and agreed to exits on Manchester and Nottingham. Um, so some really positive headlines and a stronger 9,000 bed pipeline into uh, into 2024. I mean, there were some key challenges to overcome, um, which I'll take you through now. So on the planning front, sort of three key areas here. Um, the general, general themes we're all facing when putting together large-scale planning applications, <clears throat> themes such as revisions to the national planning framework, policy framework, Changes to the Building Safety Act, uh, retention versus demolition, um, the whole life carbon debate, and of course, viability. On a cost and programme perspective, we've seen LPAs really suffering from lack of resource in certain areas. Many simply just don't have enough boots on the ground to facilitate planning applications at pace or have the ability to service PPAs, um, which is leading to an impact to timing. Um, and, and further uncertainty, which we, we all know um, is so sensitive in our sector, um, we're trying to hit the right academic year to open. And then I think finally on, on the planning front, the reception to student as a use from local communities. We know that a large number of Russell Group University cities simply don't have enough beds to, uh, to cover their intake. And I think one of the biggest challenges we face initially is the reception to PBSA when entering a market. So we're working through these areas in a number of ways. Uh, the first one being really ensuring that we have the right professional teams on the right projects, understanding who is best in the right city uh, for the right scheme um, and the right specialism. Um, through proactive engagement, which isn't new to us, but we're seeking even earlier engagement now with LPAs, but also key stakeholders, um, community councils, local residents, businesses and, and peers in the, in, in, in the sector. Uh, to open dialogue even earlier and aid relationship building at a, at a, at a much more um, early stage. Um, I think probably most importantly on the planning front, we've been trying to drive real creativity and proactivity on all of our sites. Each of our schemes is approached very differently. In Glasgow, for example, we're delivering an affordable element of PBSA within our building. In London, we've worked with the GLA to deliver an affordable solution that's relevant and appropriate to the borough that it sits in. And in York, we're exploring a mixed use approach and an affordability range. So our response really isn't replicated, but formed by specifically for each site. Moving on to, to well-being and student, um, the student experience. Um, and I think when we start any project and, and review the amenity, at the forefront of our mind is relevance. You know, what may be the talk of the town amenity today will most likely not be what our students are looking for by the time a development opens at completion stage, which can be three to five years from now. Um, which for us at Fusion and our, and our professional teams creates huge opportunity to push the boundaries and really create spaces and environments that are iconic and, and really make a statement when we're entering a market. Four key areas on this front, the first one being the customer journey. And for us as, as Fusion, that's all about creating a feeling. As developers, that customer journey starts with, you know, on day one of the feasibility stage. Um, how can we be designing and then developing a building um, that makes living as easy as possible for our customers? And for our clients, that journey starts on move-in day. It's the personal interactions with the management team, the scent in the lobby, the tech, which simplifies tasks, everyday tasks, the partial support that's offered, and those factors really making our buildings feel like their new home. On the sustainability front, we know that this is a key metric for many potential students uh, li living in our buildings. And for us as developers, it's absolutely no longer a tick box exercise, but a key metric of success um, in any development. All, all the fusion schemes in the pipeline um, are set with a target of achieving BRIAM outstanding wherever possible. And we're really doubling down on biodiversity net gain, appropriate heating and cooling systems, urban greening, and the use of non-toxic materiality within our buildings. 
Our amenity is specific to the needs of interests in each city. Um, so it's never just a cookie cutter approach. But what is a common theme across all of our portfolio is the promotion of physical and mental well-being in all of our social and private private spaces. Um, we know that amenity done wrong can be quite cavernous and unused, but done right, it can deliver space that's relevant, um, multi-purpose and really enhance the, the, the living experience. So we're introducing elements like biophilic design, noise insulated spaces for reflection, multi-sensory fit outs and facilities such as Zenroof, which is, is on the screen, a CGI of our, our, our scheme that's coming through in Nottingham. And I think for us, if there's one thing that we've learned over the past couple of years, it's that well-being, both physically and mentally, is either enhanced or hindered, should I say, uh, by where we spend most of our time. And then finally, on on on, on well-being and, and the experience that we're trying to deliver, it's all about flexibility, which goes back to my opening statement. You know, our client base changes yearly, and so do their interests. And we're designing space that really facilitates this evolving landscape. Space that can be one thing today uh, and something else in the future, but always fully accessible um, and always multi-purpose. Moving on to the construction market, um, and I think the delivery side has really seen the eye of the storm over the past 12 to 24 months with global instability, trustonomics, COVID, and still the remnants of Brexit, which has caused, as a, as a, as a mix, bill cost inflation to skyrocket between 20 to 25% over the past 18 to 24 months. We've seen contractor challenges with an increase in main and subcontractor insolvencies leading to, a, in certain areas, of a rather diminished pool of tier one, two and three contractors. Um, on top of this, we've seen regulatory changes that have been constantly evolving. Uh, we all know of second staircases, BS 991 and the Building Safety Act, uh, which causes delays in some areas and knowledge gaps in others. And I think for us, which is a good problem, the sites we're now delivering are significantly larger urban developments than when the business was first born, which comes with a, a you know, a, a, in some cases, a longer list of constraints to deal with. I think as Fusion and, you know, very fortunate that we have a best in class delivery team uh, that are combating these parts, uh, moving parts in a variety of ways. Um, early stage DD has always formed part of our acquisitions process, but we're doubling down on the level of detail that we're going into before pursuing a site. The, uh, the delivery team are engaging much earlier with the contractor market um, in the cities that we're developing in. So we really have our finger on the pulse of who's right. Um, and, and, and actually that's allowing us to get a lot clearer data um, much earlier uh, from the horse's mouth. Um, and I think as a result of delivering much bigger schemes, we're now fortunate to be driving supply chain efficiencies in, in certain areas. But most importantly in this conversation we, we reiterated this morning in the office our team is not afraid to as they call smash the break glass um early if something isn't going right so when challenges occur or changes need to be to be made that alarm is raised and we pivot to plan b c or d very early on which in the short term can cause some delays but in the long term pays dividends moving on to I guess our key theme of 2023, and I think it's one word, and that's flexibility. Looking back across all the functions of Fusion, um, the recurring theme to our success at last year was flexibility in how we work. On the acquisition side, with us being 100% privately owned, we're very fortunate to be diverse in how we structure our, 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 our deals. This has been very positive for us um, with the real aim of finding the right structure for each site. Um, from a planning uh, from a planning perspective, the introduction of alternative uses, affordability offerings, and engagement strategies has been individual to the sites in question, uh, with different solutions in each city. On the topic of amenity, I think flexibility is at the heart of of all of our space and design, with the aim of remaining relevant for the lifetime of building. The approach our construction and delivery colleagues have taken has been incredibly nimble responding and reacting in a very timely manner to incoming challenges, be them site or sector specific. And I think finally on the divestment front where flexibility is absolutely key right now, the beauty again of being privately owned allows us to formulate structures uh, to respond to the ever-changing capital markets landscape. We're not fixed in how we exit. We have incredibly strong relationships, long-term strong relationships 
with funding uh, with the funding market, um, which is hugely beneficial and we see as a massive opportunity for the year ahead. So looking at the year ahead, um, I think we we know the fundamentals of the sector remain incredibly resilient. Demand is far outstripping supply in terms of bed numbers in the cities that we're keen to, to get into and are currently in. Um, and, we, you know, we continue to see investor appetite keen to deploy capital into UK PBSA. As a business, as Fusion, we believe our, fle our flexibility will continue to remain a real USP when structuring new acquisitions, letting construction contracts with contractors and agreeing exits with, uh, exits with partners. Um, it goes without saying that there will continue to be a, a plethora of challenges. Uh, we have the political and geopolitical lands, uh, landscapes to consider. I think 40% of the world is in an election this year. Um, the inconsistencies in the planning landscape and potential further changes regulatory wise. Um, but overall, the fusion investment team and board is really encouraged by the conversations to date with the market and continue to see huge opportunity both in UK PBSA but also room for growth into uh, other living sectors. Um, that's all from me. Thank you very much for your time. I think I'm passing over to Gabriel. That's brilliant. Thank you so much uh, for that, Brody. Thank you for that insight. Thank you also, Richard, for your uh, insight before that. Great. OK, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll move on to the third uh, um, and final presentation of the day or, or segment of our presentation, which is going into a little bit more uh, detail about Chinese students in the UK in 2024, looking at some of the education trends um, from within China uh, and some of the recruitment trends that Richard has already touched on in uh, in his talk uh, and, and trying to give a little bit more detail behind the scenes uh, from the work that we conduct directly with our clients. So a little bit about Tong, we are a cross-cultural agency. Our aim is to close the gap between brands and people in and out of China. We work a lot in the property sector uh, with PBSA providers, with universities, BTR and things like that, but also with um, uh, with a lot of luxury retail fashion houses, um, targeting uh, Chinese consumers, both in Ch predominantly in China, but also here uh, in Europe and, and the UK especially. Specifically within the accommodation market, we help uh, uh, providers to reach and engage with the Chinese student opportunity. Really, and, and, and the key thing that we do is we help operators to understand what's hidden behind uh, the veil of, uh, uh, of Chinese marketplaces, which are an essential part of this recruitment process for operators at universities, but can often obfuscate what's actually happening behind the scene before they bring that final sale to you or booking to you uh, at the end of the journey. So what we do is instead, um, uh, develop and execute direct-to-consumer strategies that meet and uh, exceed uh, commercial targets, as well as building brands, launching brands to the Chinese market on the channels that matter to them behind the Chinese firewall. Okay. So in order to do that, we have to be able to know our audience really, really well. And, and, and we like to think that we offer a nuanced understanding um, of, the, uh, uh, of, of the sector that we're operating in, which is basically, obviously, young students in their, in their late teens and into their 20s, graduate researchers, and also parents who are off, most of the time funding the undergraduate and, and postgraduate experience. So first, we've got to bear in mind, there's a very unique digital ecosystem. So we spend huge amounts of our, uh, our time developing marketing strategies that um, are inspired by, but are um, completely separate to Facebook, Instagram, Google, uh, brand websites and things like that. So providers instead um, have to rely on domestic players within China, uh, such as WeChat, Red, Baidu and Douyin, uh, in order to build our, our holistic strategies. Secondly, really, really important uh, is, is the community driven nature of, of a lot of Chinese student recruitment. We find um, uh, I certainly find that, that, that we're often uh, at danger of stereotyping, but it's certainly the case for a lot of Chinese students that living with a community of their peers um, and feeling part of that community while they're abroad from China is very important. It offers a sense of security and familiarity um, uh, when this experience of studying abroad uh, and being a minority can be alienating. I, I, I certainly remember when I was studying um, actually in Japan, I, uh, you know, I, it was very comforting to me to at least have a handful of people from the UK with me to make this completely different cultural and educational experience feel a little bit more at home. And lastly, 
um, I think this speaks to some of the data that Richard was showing before. A lot of Chinese students have very high expectations. Their, their expectations around the service that they're going to be provided are as high as their spend, which is also outsized as well. So I think the ways in which operators can meet that before they come to your uh, accommodation, which will of course be, be uh, an incredible quality, is to provide a seamless booking experience as well as ongoing care throughout the year. And failing to meet the consumer on their own terms can, can, can create backlash, reputation damage that's really hard to recover from. Great. So I want to talk about some trends um, uh, in the Chinese education sector. Uh, and I want to start just by pointing to one of the questions which I saw pop up earlier, um, uh, which was about the slight dip in, in growth, the, the, the slight um, dip in, in, in acceptances from, uh, from China um, uh, in 2023. One of the key factors that we've been seeing at, at, at our agency is that in spring, summer of 2022, there were still very severe lockdowns across China, especially on the eastern seaboard, especially uh, in, in Shanghai, which is a, a, a major recruitment um, uh, city for, for internationally minded Chinese families. So as a result of that, um, uh, many of those students who had UK international offers, had offers to come and study in the UK, put off their, um, either deferred their offer completely or put off their accommodation decision until after they were literally able to leave the, uh, the city because of the severity of the lockdowns. What that meant was about October, November uh, time of 2022, uh, we saw a backlog of demand really coming through into the um, uh, into the market. Uh, and as as um, Richard was, was speaking to one city in particular in Glasgow, there was really something of a feeding frenzy, certainly on the Chinese side. I remember our team gathering around looking at uh, uh, online discussions on some of the key social media platforms and, and review platforms in China, just desperate for places to stay. Uh, so um, that was a particularly busy time um, for the reasons I've just described. And so I would say that, that um, since then and later on, we've seen more of a reversion to the norm, which is an incremental growth year on year, but a slight dip uh, compared to that really busy time. Now, just a quick note on, on China's equivalent of the A-levels, which is called Gaokao, where um, many, many millions of students take um, uh, in the summer. Firstly, we have a very, very high um, uh, um, standard uh, and expectation of students, um, uh, which you may have heard as a stereotype in China, but I just want to look to the left here. Firstly, um, there was there was one that went viral in summer last year of students who uh, um, had, had, had caught a disease, uh, perhaps it could be COVID related, who were still studying in hospital. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that's the norm, but it speaks to a trend um, of, of a huge amount of competition uh, getting into Chinese universities and, and completing this Gaokao, which can be make or break. Similarly, um, uh, it's getting increasingly difficult. Uh, there's one gentleman here, a millionaire who failed for the 27th time uh, to pass these Gaokao entrance exams. You've got to really love his dedication. There's something about the reputation, I think, uh, of passing it, like getting your high school diploma, going back and getting your high school diploma in the, in, in the US. Uh, and he failed for the 27th time, uh, even though in his own words, he'd given up both gambling and drinking uh, uh, in, in the months before. So uh, good luck to him for this year. 28th time lucky, I say. Lastly, uh, we're also starting to see uh, a slight more politicization um, uh, of some of the uh, uh, university exams. Um, uh, so, for example, there's a headline here, as you can see, uh, in the Gaokao, in the, in the A-level, uh, there was a question that went out to the millions and millions of students that take these exams, uh, specifically promoting knowledge and, and requesting knowledge or uh, uh, testing knowledge uh, of the cult of um, uh, personality of Xi Jinping or Xi Jinping fooled. So that's something really to bear in mind uh, when I talk to university professors here in the UK who are teaching Chinese students. It's something that started to be, uh, uh, become present more and more as they come to the UK. Beyond that, we also keep a, a, um, a strong track of, uh, of the kind of digital trends that we see, you know, that, that, that perhaps we might talk about on Instagram and TikTok at our marketing teams here in the UK. You've got exactly the same thing going on in China. Some of the biggest trends in, in 2023 included um, are, are kind of born out of the uh, not only hard work at uh, at, at school, um, uh, overwork, I would say, but also uh, in the graduate uh, um, employment market as well, uh, especially in the tech, the burgeoning tech sector. So there was this idea of the just thinking use, uh, youth, a generation of dreamers online where there's been so much competition and there's also so much possibility uh, in this new and richer China that leads to a sense of paralysis. And I'm sure we've all gone that, through that feeling of what am I actually going to do um, in this high pressured environment? Secondly, um, uh, we're advising our clients that, that, that your modern digital experiences should be like a snack. And uh, it was described as little pickled vegetables that you have at the start of a meal in China. They should be quick and easy and entertaining. And you see the rise of TikTok or Douyin being part of that. 
Lastly, involution, which is similar to, um, uh, uh, to, to the first one here, is this sense of competition uh, in, in, in the education and also in, the work, in your work life, leading to a sense of stagnation uh, and an over self-improvement is leading to burnout. These are the kinds of things that we have in mind, the trends that we have in mind when we're building uh, direct-to-consumer strategies for, 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 for operators. Also worth noting that you are uh, um, recruiting highly creative digital natives and really you're going to have um, uh, young people who are coming over from China um, uh, where their trip abroad or their study abroad is a, is a part of launching their own personal brand almost as much as it is studying in some cases. Um, uh, and so um, we, we, see, uh, we see that these students are fantastic at creating their own content, becoming uh, uh, digital marketing influencers or um, uh, 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 product recommenders for, for foreign brands when they're here in the UK. And they will be recording content. They will be desperate to film uh, um, uh, their experience, including perhaps at their accommodation. And that's also see, uh, seen reflected in the uh, widening choice um, selection among Chinese students who are coming to the UK, while previously uh, business and economics were the, were the top uh, choices of, um, uh, uh, of subjects to study in the UK. Now Chinese students are increasingly broadening into uh, some of the, um, the arts um, uh, uh, as well. And we see that as the increases of number of Chinese students coming to uh, arts universities such as UAL. Moving on, well, I just wanted to give a quick note about Chinese New Year. So Chinese New Year Eve is tomorrow, uh, and then the holiday itself starts um, on the 10th. It's often misunderstood a lot by uh, um, uh, by lots of us, myself included, here in, in the UK. Um, first thing to note is, is, is that you've probably got events planned if you're an operator or a university already. But it's worth noting that the 10th Chinese New Year Day is only the start of the period, whereas in Christmas, when you get to the 25th, that's kind of the apex of it, and then you're done after building up through uh, uh, December and, and perhaps November, whereas Chinese uh, New Year's Day is just the beginning. It's based on the start of the lunar solar calendar year that probably goes without saying. And each day within that period between the 10th through to the end, which will be the 24th of February this year, based on the lunar solar calendar, each day has its own set of unique customs with heavy regional uh, variations. So something you might do is ask your students, you know, uh, what do you like to do on the third or fourth day? Or the Lantern Festival, for example, the, 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 the coda to the Chinese New Year. Um, uh, what do you like to do on that day? Also, strong familial connection. This is a time that you visit relatives, um, that you take family portraits as a, uh, as a family altogether, or you pay respects to your, uh, uh, to your family members who are no longer with us. So that's really important to bear in mind while um, this may be the first time um, uh, that, that they're away from home. And it ends with the Lantern Festival and the, and the release of lanterns uh, at the end. So some common activities that you might consider include uh, big meals, some family meals. Um, you'll find your students that are sharing presents with each other, usually red envelopes. They call them red packets or red envelopes of money, either physically or digitally, uh, releasing fireworks where appropriate and perhaps some spring cleaning as well, if you're lucky. Lastly, just worth bearing in mind that uh, of the nomenclature of it is that um, uh, this festival originated in China and uh, uh, Chinese people will want to call it Chinese New Year for that reason. But within the Semitic cultural sphere in other countries such as Vietnam and, and, and Korea, um, uh, they also have their own versions of this based on this on this festival. So they might they may get offended if you call it only Chinese New Year. Um, uh, so some other options to call it Lunar New Year or the Spring Festival. Um, uh, and, and this is something we work with with our clients, such as Heathrow, who welcomes passengers from all around the world. Worth bearing in mind that this is likely to be your resident's first time away, uh, um, uh, away from their family for Chinese New Year. This important cultural moment, a bit like Christmas. Um, uh, they may wish to gather in social areas, make sure they're available. They may want to visit local Chinese restaurants if, if you have partnerships with them, all for the better. And they also may want to rang up, uh, um, hang up red posters. They may want to wear red. You'll see people wearing red. Perhaps some of your site team could even wear red as well um, uh, uh, to show some respect to that. And the reason for doing so, as I think um, students have, have illustrated earlier today and also in, in, in other reports, is that the opportunity is absolutely huge. Firstly, students uh, um, from China tend to have far higher budgets than both uh, uh, India and the UK, sitting at the top of the uh, international spend per week um, uh, by a factor of uh, uh, 40 to, 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 to 60 pounds on average per week. 
In addition, um, they usually uh, usually tend to search at different times of the year. Uh, while I mentioned in 2020, in November 2022, there was a bit of a feeding frenzy about uh, uh, November time. Usually, uh, when universities start to release their international offers, comes later, sort of the March and April time. That's when we start to see that spike that that students has got in that graph. And in general, uh, uh, um, in our experience, Chinese students look for higher quality, more expensive accommodation. They're the ones filling up those studios as, as a, 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 in large uh, proportions, as, 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 uh, as Richard was saying before. They also prefer Russell Group universities. Their subject choice is diversifying into the arts over time, as I mentioned. And it's really important that they value, uh, and, and they do value the, the post-study work visa as well um, uh, after, after finishing study. James Cleverly, the Home Secretary in December, announced a review of this um, a commitment to maintaining it um, uh, uh, but, but but also re a review of it and we will keep a close eye on how some of those visa regulations not just um, the post-study work visa but also the cost of visas which is going up the the dependent visa restrictions which we which was announced last May and is just coming into uh, in, in, into force and um, is also something that we keep a close eye on. Great, I'd like to finish up with some practical tips um, uh, for operators out there who are either marketing directly or interacting directly with Chinese students in your accommodation or in your university. So firstly, here's an interesting point that, I, that, that, that usually some of our clients don't tend to know is that, it, is that cooking and heating um, uh, is very, very different. So um, uh, traditional Chinese cooking often revolves around stir frying, steaming and boiling. And so while every Chinese household does have a rice cooker, usually electric ovens and gas ovens are really not that common to see in lots of families across China. Additionally, there's also a lot of difference in central heating uh, between different parts of China. So in, in northern China, where it's uh, roughly much colder, I mean, it's a gigantic country. It's basically a civilization is like a, bigger than Europe, uh, um, 1.4 billion people. So um, at one point, the, uh, the communist government decided everyone in the north of China is going to get central heating uh, and uh, everyone in, in, in the south of China are not going to have central heating. It's not quite as simple as that in, 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 in real terms, but that was part of the decision. That's why it's understandable that a lot of students who Chinese students who come to the UK, they have difficulties operating uh, sometimes ovens and sometimes central heating systems. So having that training in place was something that's really obvious for us growing up in, um, in the UK is something worth bearing in mind. Also, if you look at the bottom there, it's a photo I took when I, when I just got off the plane in Shanghai. I was feeling dehydrated. Um, I wanted to go and get a drink. I went to the water machine and the only options I had were hot water and water. Well, that's something to bear in mind that 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 uh, in Chinese culture, it's extremely common only to drink boiling hot water and letting it cool down because it seemed to aim digestion. Some more practical tips. Um, uh, we find that our that our recruitment team and our customer service team um, handle complaints of, of of alleged racism against site management teams. Uh, one of the reasons for this is 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 after site management teams put signs uh, up in the accommodation that says that are only in Chinese and in English. And the, and, the, and the sound or the, uh, sorry, the impression that gives is that um, it's Chinese students who aren't putting rubbish in the bin. Well, to avoid this kind of thing from happening, we might consider writing the sign in a variety of languages as well. And, but crucially, bear in mind that how a student reacts online on uh, Chinese digital platforms may be totally different to how they've communicated with you and the interaction that you've had with them. So it's really important to have a close eye on uh, how you're being perceived on Chinese social media, which is where students go to go and find who to trust uh, when they come to the UK. Last one here uh, is about the magic words, please. So um, in the UK, obviously we'd say, please may I have some water, please hand me some water. Actually in China, that can put some distance between you and the person when you add qing, which is the word please. That can be very formal. So actually what you find is when Chinese people are, are, are trying to show their closest to you and friendliness to you as a, as, a, as, a, as a site team, as someone in the site team, they might just say, give me some water, which may come across as quite rude. Just something to bear in mind. And the issue is when things go wrong, um, if and when there are arguments between site teams and, uh, um, and Chinese students, which, which uh, we're sometimes uh, uh, brought in to manage, um, they will go onto platforms such as Red, which I will uh, finish off by talking about, um, uh, in order to complain about you. And unfortunately, um, uh, this is the kind of content that is engaged heavily um, uh, by uh, Chinese students, both in the UK and also at home looking for, uh, looking for accommodation. And this is the kind of reputation that you need to protect. So how do you do that? How do you build a Chinese proposition? I realize we're coming up against time, so I'm not gonna to take too much of your time, but the key things are hygiene factors. 
conduct a full digital audit. How are you being discussed? Because you are being discussed already on these Chinese platforms. They may be new to you or you may know them already, but someone is talking about their experience. It's just if you know it or not. Do you have brand owned Chinese social media? Do you have and need a website, say, for example, and is it even hosted in China? Do you take Chinese payments? Making it easier for Chinese students to work with you directly and to book with you directly um, uh, uh, will increase their likelihood of booking directly through you and re re reduce your reliance on agency commissions. And things that might help you to do that might be uh, a WeChat mini program uh, or even a Chinese website. Make sure you've got some good resident engagement activities, such as for Chinese New Year, conduct a survey in Mandarin, and make and you may consider having Mandarin speaking staff at some of your sites as well. Great. I'm going to skip through actually uh, a, a, a lot of this because I, I'm respectful of people's time, or I'm trying to be, um, uh, but there's a very diverse and digital ecosystem um, uh, that I can spend hours talking about. But um, this is something that we pick up directly with our clients. So if this is the kind of thing that you'd like to learn more about, please do let me know. But the most important one is red. It's basically Instagram and Pinterest uh, combined. Um, and it's where people go, especially young Chinese, to learn about things like fashion and travel and retail, hospitality experiences, basically. And that's where they go online to talk about their study abroad experience, to not only market their experience as part of their own personal brand, but also to warn fellow students at home um, against negative experiences that they may have had. And here are some examples here. Fantastic. That brings me to the end. If you'd like to learn more, um, please do ask um, uh, um, about uh, um, uh, uh, about uh, the work that we do, including our report that we've just uh, we've put out recently. Thank you for your time, and I'm going to hand back to Richard now. Thanks, Gabriel. Um, we've got a few minutes to a few questions. We'll maybe overrun by five ten minutes, just to try and get through a few of those. Um, thanks both Brody and, and Gabriel. Really interesting insights um, and a lot of nuances there as well. For anyone that does want to kind of get up to date data on the market, do make sure you signed up to our to our newsletters. Um, Ashley, I'll pass back to you. I think we can quickly go through some of the poll results and then we'll try and tackle uh, some of the questions. Um, again, conscious of time, but we'll try and get a few, a few of those sorted. Yeah, and for anyone that does have to drop off, we'll try and maybe answer some questions, um, maybe in a post on our website um, or via email um, afterwards. Um, in case we don't get through them all. So just having a quick look at the poll questions, which you should see on your screen now. Um, so for our first question, where we asked how expectations have changed in terms of rental growth, um, most people are actually quite neutral, maybe leaning towards positive rather than negative. So that's very good. Um, in terms of um, considering the maintenance loads when setting rents, um, it's actually very spread, um, kind of slightly more saying not at all and then um yes it was a consideration um but still a very fair number saying no but we will um third question um based on early booking trends have we seen um demand from china changing um quite a lot of people have said decreased but it's close to unchanged and there are still people that are saying increased so probably quite location dependent um, and then the final poll question um, with recent reports suggesting there's been a decline in Indian students. Um, most people are expecting a, a small impact um, and that, you know, maybe in some places there might be a slightly larger impact. Again, it will probably depend on the demographic um, of your clients. Um, but I think we're probably all a little bit more interested in hearing from our panel. Um, so we do have some questions that have been asked by our audience. Um, I'll just dive straight into the first one, which says, I'm interested to understand the depth of Chinese student demand for PBSA accommodation and how that might change as the Chinese economy weakens and increasing PBSA rents put further pressure on Chinese finances. Um, Rich, I might throw that to you first. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess it's a complicated question. I think there's a lot of influence and factors in there. Um, so, for example, Yes, rents have been rising in the UK, and, and we've seen some of the budget stats around what Chinese students can afford relative to UK, but it's never quite that simple because obviously you have to take into account things like currency fluctuations as well. I think the key difference, and Gabriel kind of mentioned it already, is who's really funding that university experience. Um, so in China, you know, it's potentially multiple family members helping to fund that. Um, in the UK, it's probably the opposite of that. You might get some help from you know, mum and dad, essentially. I think kind of going back to the UK market, um, again, we've touched on maintenance loan growth, but I think particularly in the current environment where you know, 
parents, guardians, for example, and I, I've mentioned this in previous sessions, if you're facing a 50% increase in your mortgage repayments due to cost of debt, the ability to then fund your offspring's university experience may be completely wiped out by that increase, um, potentially. So I think for UK students, it's a particular challenge at the moment, um, and it'd be interesting to see how that it potentially plays out to, to future domestic demand. Um, Chinese buys, though, I mean, again, we've seen those long-term stats, they're all very positive. So it appears, at least at the moment, it's not having any real negative impacts. Yeah, and, and, and just to echo that, I mean, um, in, in what we see in the market, sort of slightly more qualitative, uh, uh, qualitatively, um, is not a huge amount of complaints about rising rents, uh, more so about the increase in, in visa costs. Um, uh, especially as, as you know, uh, visa restrictions for European um, uh, people to go to China are being removed altogether, um, especially for or initially for France and Germany and Italy, countries like that, not the UK yet. But the cost is much lower, um, uh, whereas student visas and, and postgraduate visas are all going up um, uh, with some other restrictions as well. So we see more um, reaction to that news than the year on year rental growth. Brody, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think, you know, for, for us, at the moment, we don't have any live beds that are either in planning or, or under construction. But looking back at our, our first two portfolios, no doubt that Chinese students made up a large part of our, our cohort in, in certain developments. Um, you know, what we are monitoring and, and seeing at various data sets that show an increased percentage of students who are entering the, the, the PBSA sector from, from other regions, uh, Singapore, Nigeria, we've touched on the UAE. So I think when we start to go live in 2027 with some active beds, um, we will probably see a broader demographic um, of, of students occupying our, our developments. But I don't think the Chinese you know, students are, are going to rapidly drop off the cliff now. Okay, I'll um, move quickly on to the next question. Um, again, on China. Um, do the current stats confirm a significant drop in overseas applications from China and also the recent news that numbers from India are down 30%? Um, yeah. yeah, I guess we won't spend too long on this one because I appreciate we've had a few more just try and get through. But yeah, I mean, really, as the kind of UCAS stats said, yes, there has been a slight dip in Chinese acceptances for this year. Um, but again, as, as Gabriel said, that's probably more just reverting to the norm and the fact that the previous years were so bullish from a demand growth standpoint. And we've seen that across various universities, right? I mean, some universities essentially over-recruited during COVID and then have massively cut back their recruitment this year because they realised that essentially they recruited too many due to, to grade deflation during that time. Um, in terms of India, again, UK, or well, sorry, undergraduate stats don't suggest there's been a big drop-off where it's difficult to get accurate data around that postgrad numbers, particularly with the delays from HESA. So, yeah, difficult to, to give too much insight into that just at this point in time. Yeah, one, one additional point, I'd agree with that. One additional point is that the Chinese government last year announced that um, you actually have to be um, uh, in the country that you're studying in uh, um, to have your course accredited by, by the Chinese government. So that, that led to a small dip um, for people who were trying to study from home. Really interesting. Thank you. Um, so maybe this is one for you, Brody. Um, what consistency do you feel there is across different councils in terms of affordable rents required on new PBSA? Do you feel there should be a national requirement or regional variations? Yeah, I think um, London's very clear. Uh, abiding to the London plan creates a you know, clear path uh, for affordable and what we need to deliver. I think the regions are a lot more opaque and it's really down to us as developer operator um, to structure rooms and products, a uh, rent that sort of responds to, to each city. So for example, in Glasgow, what we're doing by implementing an affordable element that we know that the universities and local council fully support in York, which we're exploring as well. And, you know, I think our perspective, this is very much driven by the conversations in each of these local authorities in the regions. You know, what's right in, in one city uh, may not be right in, in another. So having a national requirement would be useful to a degree. But I think a more specific approach, you know, regional city by regional city would deliver a more relevant a more relevant product and an and affordability range. Um, I don't think we can compare like for like necessarily. Yeah, I guess uh, kind of to add to that and maybe to, to Brody throw a question back as well. I mean, we've obviously worked with a number of developers, investors on on the planning side, and 
I guess where there seems to be a lack of consistency is even something as simple as working out or calculating the level of demand in a given borough in terms of the council's not necessarily having a standardized approach to actually work out what the level of demand is in the first place. Um, so I'm not sure if that's something you've seen. And I guess the other point is, again, you know, <clears throat> various conversations we've had with similar companies to yourselves, I think there is a lot of negativity around generally the planning environment. Do you see any way past that or any way that's going to improve over the long term? Because my impression is no. So it'd be interesting to see if you think there, be, there can be an improvement to speed things up, for example. Yeah, I think on the, on the, on the first point, improving that demand, um, I would imagine three, five, seven years ago, it was probably here's a report and that was enough. I think now, certainly in my experience and and and, and I think my colleagues' experience, it's, it's very much here's a report, here's another report, you know, here's some other statistics and maybe not from necessarily just the big uh, agency and research houses, but but other more impartial um, independent bodies as well, which, and, and they all say the same thing, but it's about tying it all together and sort of taking the local authority on a journey um, and an educational piece in some areas. Um, on the planning front, you know, we have a very mixed approach, I'm sure much like many others. Um, it's regional, it's council by council. We as a as, as fusion take it, you know, take it the same way wherever it is, early engagement, working collaboratively. Um and we do get there. It, you know, some places it just take slightly longer than others. But you know, for the reasons I mentioned in my uh, in my presentation earlier, I think just lack of resource um and the, the lack of availability of case officers, it, it just makes it incredibly hard for them. They want to see these things off their desk and their, their city centre is changing. So, you know, it's not it's not a, a problem that they want either. Um, but early engagement, um, a collaborative working uh, approach with us and them, as opposed to it being loggerheads, we try and take everyone on the journey together. Yeah, cool. Makes sense. Um, on a slightly related note, um, we've had a question. What is the opportunity for student housing in Zone 1 London? Um, Brody? Yeah, I think for us as Fusion Zone 1, you know, was previously quite an untouchable market. There were there were a lot of competing uses. Um, I think for reasons that we all know, there's been structural changes in the office market, in the residential market, and PBSA is now the higher value alternative use. And we fusion see zone one as an incredibly strong opportunity. Um, absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, yeah, you only have to look at the, the fundamentals, right? Supply and demand in, in London, they are yeah. very positive. Yeah. I think we might make this the last question. Appreciate we have overrun. Um, but thank you for everyone for sticking around as long as you have. So um most important to get your questions answered. Um, so maybe this one's more um Gabriel's expertise. Um, the question is, international students, especially postgrads, have grown strongly in recent years with a spike in visas for dependents. How big will the negative impact be on international student numbers from the tightening of visa rule for dependents in coming years? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, we've seen a lot of noise, haven't we, last year about about um, uh, uh, restrictions and trying to bring down let, net legal mi migration um, uh, by the Home Office. Uh, um, I think with regards to Chinese students specifically, about which I know a little bit more, what we tend to find is that the many postgraduates who come either come through the undergraduate route um, uh, straight into postgraduate, or they come mostly for one year postgrad masters, and they tend not to bring dependents. So some of those rules are not the ones that are being talked about the most that we find, and they, they tend to not to be the impediment at the moment. As I say, if, if the government reviews the post-study graduate route to the PSW visa scheme, uh, because that makes the UK such an attractive place for both undergraduates and short-term postgraduates to come um, uh, um, to then join the workforce um, afterwards. Um, uh, if the government seriously reviews that, then I think we'll, we'll, we'll be in some trouble. But for the moment, it doesn't seem to have had, a, I don't think it's going to have a dramatic impact for the moment. Um, anything to add, Rich? Yeah, no, I think I, I totally agree. I mean, we've looked at those those stats in the last three months or so, and it's predominantly not going to impact the Chinese market. Um, I guess the other point to note is that, again, it will be very specific to the universities. You know, some universities have a lot higher exposure to, for example, Nigerian or Indian students 
and therefore those are the ones that are going to be predominantly at risk from those those changes. Um, so again, it will come down to yeah individual universities and, and locations. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's going to have a dramatic declining impact on on the Chinese market, which again is probably going to be the most important aspect for for PBSA. Okay, I think we might have to wrap it up there. And thank you, everyone who did stay on for those extra 10 minutes. Um, but we really do want to make sure we answer your questions. Um, what we'll do is we'll take any that haven't we haven't managed to answer now, and we'll um, see if we can answer them online. Um, and we'll be in touch um, somewhere in your emails. <laughs> um, however, we've done that. Um, I think maybe we might have a post on our website that we can link in our newsletter or via email. Um, so Thank you so much to our panel. Um, obviously, we're really grateful and to be able to put on these webinars, we think it's a real um, industry um, benefit. Um, so, yeah, um, thank you to everyone who joined and to our lovely panel. Thanks, Brody and Gabriel. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers. Thank you.